Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Mail Right uh, podcast. It's episode number 303, my amazing host has told me. We're meeting with a real estate process um, professional, is what I'm just going to say for the introduction of the show. Her name is Jess, and uh, I, I'm a little bit trepidatious about her last name, so Jess, <laughs> I'm going I'm to hand it over to you and say, if you could give everybody your first and last name, if they want to look you up, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So Jess Lonevel, um, my last name, it, that's not my maiden name either. I'm, I married into that name and don't you worry, everybody butchers, butchers it to, to a certain extent. <laughs> I didn't, I let you butcher it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Thanks so much for having me. It is, uh, it is a lovely, it's amazing. Thank you so much for making the time to come on the show, John. And I really appreciate it before I launch into that though, John, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to anybody that might be new to the show? Yeah, that's great. I'm the founder and jo- founder and CEO of Melwright, where we build websites for real estate agents, and we offer a lot of additional advice and functionality with, with our own inbuilt CRM, um, text and email platform, all built on WordPress. You own your own website. We manage it for you so if that's interesting go over to the mail right website um amazing all right so uh just among many other things you have uh a website called the listings lab and it's uh talking about how to grow audience boost income become number one but but in the intro to this particular show uh, we talked to you about talking about process specifically yeah. and you, you agreed, but that's not necessarily all that you do alone. So why don't you, what in, in the broad way of, of, of us getting into a conversation about processing, why don't you tell people what you're a little bit about your history and who you are so that we can have like everybody who's listening can have a, a good understanding of who it is that they're listening to. A hundred percent. So, um, I grew up in the industry. My mom's been a realtor for 35 years. Um, I started doing her paperwork at around 13. So, uh, you know, I've been in the industry for a long time. When I came out of school at 21, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I got my license just to kind of like get my feet wet, see if I liked it. Ended up selling real estate for about 14 years. Um, myself, I built a multiple, multiple seven figure, very lean team. Um, and then, uh, several years ago I made the switch over to teach agents how to do what I did, which was basically not only have, you know, build out a small lean team, build out your systems, your processes, your marketing, um, but also get to a point where you can have that multiple seven figure income and not have to work as hard as most agents do. So a lot of it is, it kind of comes down to creating the kind of lifestyle that most people got in the business for in the first place, which, you know, I, in my opinion, I think most people get into real estate for three reasons. They want uh, unlimited income, freedom, to be able to set their own schedules and not have to like clock in and clock out. And also to be able to help people. I think, you know, the majority of agents out there are to a certain extent service driven. So, um, we really kind of focus on those three things. And, and a lot of the time, what ends up happening is agents get into the business and they actually never achieve most of those things, most of those three things. So it really kind of comes back down to not only getting them to a point where they have consistent, predictable, um, growing businesses of inbound business. So they're not building a business of chasing, but also that, you know, once they're at a certain point in their business, that they're able to automate leverage, create, create processes and standard operating procedures for their business to create an actual company within their brokerage so that they can travel. And, you know, we even have agents in our programs who are in location independent, you know, running a business in a major city from somewhere like Costa Rica, where their team runs and they're able to, you know, have those income goals continually being hit, but not even necessarily having to be physically present. Gotcha. Um, there is another guest that we had that you probably know that we had on the show long ago called uh, by the name of is it Michael Hellickson. Is that did I get that right, John? Hellickson. I haven't got I haven't got the website up, so um, <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't I couldn't confirm that. Um, yeah, Club Wealth, Michael Hellickson. I actually mm-hmm. got it right, so I'm mm-hmm. I'm extre- I'm extremely excited that I got it right. And he describes real estate careers in in 
in like levels, like level one, you're making $100,000 and $150,000 a year. And here's how I describe it. Level one, you're learning how to sell real estate in general. You're learning how to go out, sell a home, do the contract, you know, find a couple of, of new, you know, new people, figure out what your advertising and sales methodology is going to be right. And all of that, if you do it well, gets you to $100,000 dollars $150,000 income. The next level, which is the much bigger level is, and the medium level is where you figure out how to multiply that, how you do it more efficiently. And then the top level, of course, which is what we're talking about for those listening to the show, is the level where you've already got a three or $400,000 income. And now it's time for you to figure out how to start replacing yourself as in, in as many places inside the process as you mm-hmm. possibly can so mm-hmm. that you can reclaim your time, which will end up becoming more valuable than your money for most of the people that are in that level. Would you agree with with what I just said. Absolutely. Jeff. Absolutely. And I think that there's like, there's even within that top level, there's like mini levels, right? So we, we always have agents when, once they get to a certain point to do an energy audit, and then we provide, or we, we assign values, monetary values to different activities within the business. And we, we really make sure that that person is not only staying within their zone of genius, the things that they love to do and that they're really good at, but also over time, getting rid of anything that is actually below their, um, their out their, their hourly rate, right. And making sure that they're only focused on high leverage activities. So those thousand dollar an hour plus type activities. Gotcha. Um, John, I have, I have plenty of ways I can go with this, but uh, so far we have not handed it over to you. So why don't we do that? Yeah, what, you know, what's been on your radar recently? Is there anything that, that's, that's in your mind that's come up the past couple of weeks where an agent was doing something or didn't understand or had a process that they could really change quite rapidly and it would make a big difference that's come on your radar lately? I think that one of the main things that we do with everybody who kind of, who, who we work with is right off the bat, we systematize their actual service. So, you know, it, we create what we call a signature system, an expert methodology, some sort of like a core service package that is repeatable and predictable. And I think that a lot of the time what happens is, especially when agents are alone and by themselves initially, um, they, they tend to kind of fly by the seat of their pants, Mm -hmm. right? Like they know all the things that need to get done and somehow they always end up getting them done. (laughs) Right. But there's no, there's no actual system to it. So, um, a lot of the time what ends up happening is it takes a lot more time than it needs to. And also, you know, there are little things that can be adjusted instead of, you know, saying, oh, well, I have to spend all afternoon this afternoon. I have to go pick up this deposit check over there and drop my lockbox lock box over here and then deliver the check over here and get the receipt back to my office. You know, in my opinion, I think so many agents are wasting time and wasting energy and things like that when a courier can probably do that for 30, for $30. But instead of like changing the way that they're thinking and actually creating a systematized process and some standard operating procedures for each step of the process, you know, the, the thing that we want to do as we scale is be able to re- have a system, some automation and other people within our, within our business repeat what we do well, right? So I think part of that is right off the bat being able to document it. And I think that a lot of the time that that documentation doesn't happen well. So right off the bat, we need to figure out, for, and, and this goes both back end and mark from a marketing capacity. What is that signature system, that expert methodology? Because then what we're able to do is communicate that because from a marketing perspective, most, most of the public also thinks that most agents make it up as we go and fly by the seat of our pants. And so <laughs> what they're trying, you know, it's, well, it's true, right? It's like, well, I might as well just use my cousin. Cause she's going to do exactly the same thing as everyone else is going to do. Right. So it, it really comes down to like, are you actually providing a highly valuable systematized service? is this an actual service package or are you just kind of running around and help and, and helping as many people as you can? Does that make sense? Oh, totally. Okay, Absolutely. cool. <laughs> you, you explain, well, I don't know if this word, I have a tendency or a habit of making words, Jess. Uh, um, <laughs> making words. Uh, um, I call it prototization. You know, you're, you've got a service, but you're prototizing it. Yeah, hundred percent. But I'm not absolutely sure if that word absolutely. Well, exists. we're using it. Yeah. So if enough people <laughs> keep using it, 
It will it will exist, won't it, Jess? Won't it? I agree. I couldn't agree uh, more. That's how words become words. Exactly, and I'm doing my best to make to extend the English language. So um, over to you, Robert. Um. So in terms of who it is that you typically talk to, because yeah. I was trying to level this out, because I usually try to to explain to our audience who the guest is, like, yeah, like where, where their field of expertise, mm-hmm. who, what kind of real estate professional that impacts. Yeah. You yourself have been, as you said, either a small team leader or another language, like language might be saying that you are a broker. Is that mostly who you're talking to? Is that mostly who calls you up and says, hey, I need your services. And, you, and then you're talking about their areas of genius and things like that. Is that who you're speaking to? Most so of we time? have two different levels of just, just the way that anybody else, we've got two different kind of product levels. We've got the level of that six figure agent who wants to create, who basically like they're not ready for systems and automation and all of those things. What they actually need right now is inbound clients, right? So it, it, sometimes it's that shift from, okay, I've been cold calling and door knocking and flyers and billboards and all of these things. And I want to learn how to be a digital marketer. And I want to, I want to learn how to get people to be coming to me. I want to create those relationships at scale. So that's kind of product number one, which is the listings lab. So that's that six figure agent who wants to create the marketing foundations to go to seven figures. Then we have our seven figure agent program. That seven figure agent program is all the stuff that we've been talking about, which is the systems, the automation. Uh, It's basically, we have six pillars that we go through to help that agent get to a sustainable, happy seven figure business. And so we, we work them through each of these six, these six pillars to make sure that the business is repeatable, predictable, and over time that we're able to actually buy them their time back. And um, like, I'll use Justin as an example, because he's someone who has kind of gone through this process very recently. He came into the program doing about 150,000 a year. He probably was like really on like the low end of like, you know, who we normally accept into a program like this, but he was highly coachable. Um, he came in, he built out the systems, the processes, he, his social media, we got all of that really like on point, his digital marketing was all like worked on. Um, we, we worked on the team, the hiring, the people who he needed to have in each role. He really only wanted to sit in the listing agent seat. So, you know, the buyer agents were built out and trained and, and all of that. And within, Within eight months, he went from that 150 to a very solid seven figure run rate. And he'll do, he'll do a million, million and a half with his hands tied behind his back this year, as well as he's bought so much time back. He's actually starting a second business. Right. And, and to me, sorry, go ahead, John. We just need to go for a break, Rob. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, everybody who's in real estate, who's listening to this podcast, stay tuned. We're going to have some really cool conversations with Jess after the break. Three, two, one. Welcome back to the Mail Right Show. We are in episode 303. We are talking to a world-class process expert who is going to talk to you about what is necessary to go from earning six figures to seven figures. And if you're in the seven figures, how to go from small seven figures to maybe doubling or tripling your income. And the best part, my personal favorite part about this entire conversation, because the money for me personally doesn't move the needle. What moves the needle is getting my time back while still making the money. That to me is 10 times more valuable than the dollars that we're talking about. That's my, just my personal opinion has nothing to do with our guests, but uh, just so let's say you, you just gave us a great case study. We're talking about a young uh, gentleman that was on the low end of being qualified for your program, but you took him on anyway. He went from, I think you said, low six figures into seven figures, and he started a second business, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's basically what you said. So let me ask you a quick question. If you were to look inside, we all know we can use big words like process and say yeah. that that can recover your time, but it's a big word. Yep. And it evolves like in the, in the example that you just gave the case study, you, you listed eight areas of focus just in like 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. If I was going to say I'm making $400,000 as a real estate agent, but I'm working my freaking ass off and you as a process expert, are, I, I, what would be the first broad area of the business that you'd say, tell that person to look at 
in order to recover some of their time? So that would really depend on the person. Usually what we do is the first thing that we would do is what we call an energy audit, which is every single thing that they're doing in the day needs to be documented. So we need to figure out where they're spending their time so that we can figure out where their time's being wasted. So the very, so, so we do a full energy audit first, we figure out, you know, what, like, and then we assign values to each of those tasks. We also figure out what it is that they actually enjoy doing because like my opinion and like what I find is if I'm doing something that I don't, that I'm not very good at and I don't like, it's going to feel a lot more painful than if I'm doing something that lights me up and gives me joy and that I'm having a great time doing. So the first thing that we want to do is add a little bit more enjoyment back into the business and get rid of the stuff that they hate doing. But from a time, from a time leverage standpoint, we also, and I use this, I got this from Tim Ferriss years and years ago is do we eliminate it? Do we automate it? Or do we outsource it? Right. So we always, that, and that's the order that we want to go. We want to go through each, each and every task. Can it be eliminated? Can it be automated? And then can it be outsourced? I think most people in real estate tend to outsource first. The very first thing that they think of is, okay, can I hire somebody to do this for me? Instead of really looking at the pro at, at looking at that task and looking at that thing that's taking up the time and saying, is there an automation? Is there a piece of software? Is there a website? Is there, is there a service provider that can do this for me? for 150 bucks a month, instead of me trying to pay somebody $5,000 a month or $3,000 a month or whatever to, to do this manually. So right. the systems, right? Like, so, so it's, 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 you know, what's the most efficient way for us to get this off your plate right away. Um, then we go, th we, we kind of go through the process of, okay, now does this work that, so now we've decided this needs to be outsourced. Does this actually require a certain level of skill what is that level of skill? Can a virtual assistant do this? Does it actually require like an in-house administrator or something like that? And then, you know, it, it's all of this is about not only buying back the time, but also doing it in the least expensive or least costly way. Sure. And for those of you who are listening to the show, a name was dropped there very quickly. That was uh, Tim Ferriss. He is the author of a book called The Four Hour Work Week, mm -hmm. um, and he is uh, he is probably one of the he's he's the father of the idea of the new rich, which is which is an idea that's really common among millennials and is becoming more common among older generations. Which is uh, wealth can be measured in two ways: it can be measured in money, it also can be measured in freedom. And in the world that we live in today, more and more, I frequently I think. People are, are weighing the, uh, the concept that wealth is actually freedom of time. And it certainly seems that's something that is common in your language. It seems, mm -hmm. to, be it seems to be something that's important to you personally, since we mm -hmm. opened the show by you saying, hey, you're moving to the Bahamas. So um, it is important to me. I'm, I'm one of the new rich where you can, you, if you gave me a million dollars, but told me I had to work 80 hours a week, I have no joke. I would just say, nope, take it, keep it. Don't, don't need it. Don't want it. What do you think about that, John? Well, the, you where know, do you fall? Where do you fall? Well, there is scientific um, research that has proven to some extent that any income above $75,000 in the US, um, the level of happiness that you obtain above that mean figure diminishes quite rapidly. So the idea that if you reached 150000 or if you reach 250,000 that that you're going to be twice as happy as when you were earning $75,000 is delusionary but on the other hand living in poverty isn't great either so i suppose we're talking about that would you agree Jess <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, part of part of earning more or or having more disposable income only really matters if you, you know, have the freedom to do something with it. You know, the way that I define freedom is a little bit different than most people. Um, I see money as a tool to create more freedom. So, you know, my idea of freedom is I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whoever I want, wherever I want, 
right? Yeah. Like, th- like that's really like, like my concept of freedom. And I think that it takes a tremendous amount of money to be able to do that. Um, but at the same time, there's different levels of freedom and there's people who just want to be able to spend, you know, you know, instead of working eight hours a day, they want to work four hours a day Yeah, and, and they I want think, to be able to spend time with their kids. Yeah. I think the other importance, uh, which is very widespread in this industry is that if you don't get to grips about process and things escalate, you're going to burn out quite rapidly, Mm -hmm. aren't you? Mm -hmm. And I've been there. I mean, the first time I hit seven figures, I did it as a single agent with, um, with no team, with no, with very little support. And, um, I remember, you know, my phone ringing, it was a client. I knew it was a client and handing the phone to my husband and crying and telling him that someone else needed to answer the phone that I literally could not answer one more phone call. Um, and, and kind of losing myself in my business. And I think that that's one of the main reasons why what we teach and the things that are really important to me is making sure that the six, the success is all around success. And it's not just like, there's a lot of really, like, just like John was saying, there's a lot of really unhappy, really rich people. Oh yeah. Right. I've been one of them. Yeah. One of the most unhappy, the, one of the most unhappiest times in my life when I was running one of the largest call centers uh, in the world of its type. And I was making a very healthy income for doing it. I was living in like a $600 a month apartment and I was making mid six figures. You would think that I was stoked out of my mind, but I was working seven days a week. I was yeah. on call. The owner of the business was literally insane and on medication. And so I was, I was receiving insane phone calls in the middle of the night. Yeah. And I was like, I was so unhappy that when that job ended, it felt like, like the angels were yeah. singing yeah. you and you would go, well, go, but that money, I was like, oh my God, it did. That was the, my last it's not and worth final it. time yeah. that I chased anything for money. I'm like, yeah. never, mm-hmm. ever, ever again. And I have not, I've honored that. And I'm super proud of myself. Um, before we lose our time with you, mm. uh, your, your website identifies something that, that I am very hot on. I'm curious to hear your take on it, but you talk about intimacy a little bit. You have this yep. uh, pie chart and you say relevancy, yep. intimacy, and omnipresence. But one of the things that you say within your little blurb about intimacy uh, is, is one of my core principles as both a business owner, a salesperson, a person that has hundreds of real estate clients, that, and I talk about marketing messaging all day long, all the time. I talk about it on my blog. What did you mean when you said, it, you say it on your website, anybody interested can go to the listinglab.com and see what she said, but I want to hear your take in person while we have you, what your take is on intimacy and, and inside marketing messaging and the real estate career profession. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that a lot of the messaging that people are using and the way that they're using marketing in the real estate industry as a whole is a little bit old, right? We, we, we tend to, and, and I learned this too, as like a 20, you know, an early 20 year old brand new agent, I was basically taught how to be like a door to door, use sales car, like you use car salesman. It was very pushy. It was very like, look at me, look at me. This is about me. I'm number one, you know, all of those things. And, you know, what I found, even just from a human psychology standpoint, right? We hear all the time this cliche of you want to build no like and trust. Now, you can't build no like and trust unless you actually create some transparency between you and the P and your audience you and the people that you're trying to connect with. And this idea of intimacy is actually creating relationships and having people, and and some of this actually comes from polarization, right? And being able to attract the people who are actually your people and and repel the people who are not your people. And, And a lot of that comes down to just being vulnerable, being honest, being real about the kind of things that, you know, we, we use personal content for this. So when I'm talking about personal content, it really comes down to, you know, personal beliefs, personal philosophy, personal story, right? All, you can use all the th- fancy things in the world, but at the end of the day, connection, conversation and connection are going to be your number one reasons why people choose you. People make it, make decisions emotionally first, and then they back the decision up with logic 
right? You can be the best, you can be the number one agent in your entire market. And if somebody doesn't like you, they're not going to work with you. And so a lot of this comes down to, yes, you need credibility. Yes, you need, you know, you need to be, you need to be credible. You need to have the authority, all of those things. But the missing piece, I think for most agents is that intimacy piece. It's that connection. It's the conversation. It's the, it's creating deeper connections with people and it can be done online, right? Relationships are the key to everything. And how would you do it online? How would you do it? So the way that we, that we teach it and the way, and the, the way that I like to do it is through content. And if you're going to do it at, on, on a larger scale, it really comes down to, are you being completely authentic and completely transparent with your audience? Right. Are you talking about not like nobody wants, nobody wants perfection anymore. Can perfection's boring. You know, there's all, there's a million people out there online trying to pretend like they're perfect. Their life is perfect. Their business is perfect. Everything about them is perfect. And that's, there's actually no, there's no connection that happens that way. Real connection comes from hardships. It comes from shared experiences and it comes from the the person who is creating this audience or creating this content, being transparent about the struggles that they've had. One of the things that I, I launched the listings lab on, and it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a strategy. It was just, it happened to be the way that we did it is entrepreneur magazine wrote an article about me. Um, and the, 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 I think the tagline was from domestic violence to, you know, surviving domestic violence to finding love and building a seven figure empire. Okay. Right. So, so there was just all like right off the bat, it was, well, here's who I am. And these are what my experiences have been. And it hasn't all been, you know, perfect and rosy, but you know, I've, I've, I've come out the other side of it. And if you don't like me because of it, okay. But if you do, then fantastic. Let's connect further. Right. Well, I can, I can definitely say for myself that I really like you, Jess. Uh, <laughs> <Thank> uh, you. <laughs> and uh, Ro- I'm, I've got a feeling Robert has warmed to you as well. So I think we need to wrap it up, don't we? And then maybe have, um, I think you've got enough time, have we? Uh, I think for I've another- I've got fu- seven more minutes. So yeah, right, let's, let's, I can let's be wrap it up halfway through. This, yeah, and then you might, and I can end it with our bonus content if you need to disappear. Perfect. Beautiful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for staying tuned. We've had this uh, incredibly interesting, relevant conversation with what has been a seven-figure real estate earner who now has turned uh, part of her business into a consultancy. And uh, she's going to teach you how to earn seven figures if you're not already doing so. And if you are already doing so, but you feel like you're, you're doing so with too much effort, she would also be a great person to listen to on this podcast and look up outside of it. So with no further ado, Travel over to the Mail Right video channel on YouTube. It is Mail Hyphen Right, and uh, we'll see you there for the bonus content. Three, two, one. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You are now looking at our beautiful or ugly mugs, depending on which one of us you're talking about. I was not referring to myself as a beautiful one, just so everybody knows. Um, and then uh, we're going to uh, be continuing our conversation with Jess, who who just acknowledged that uh, one of the ways her business got started was that she had an uh, article, I think, in Entrepreneur Magazine. Is that what mm-hmm. you said? Yeah. Um, uh, I've read it. I've actually got a follow-through question, actually. Um, depending on the source of the statistic that you read, the real estate industry in the US, and I'm not I don't, I would imagine it's the same in Canada. It's quite dominated by female agents. You yes. know, the figure is either 65 to 75% of agents are female. Um, but when you look, you know, you look at the guests, you know, I have attempted to get as many female experts as I can on this show. But when, but we do regularly have months where all the guests, um that we interview are male um have you got any insight why that is and also just a quick added element i find a lot of the marketing messaging that's out there still i classify it as quasar masculine agreed it's very it's very yeah. in your face yeah you know kill slaughter the animal you know <laughs> uh feed the family you've got to go out there and kill the wheat 
the uh, wildebeest and bring back the bacon <laughs> in the man of transactions. Yeah. It's all yeah. very masculine. Agreed. But, you know, I like your views about that. I, I you know, I think that, um, I think that there are, I think there's room. I think that that's, that's kind of the, the, a good way of saying it is that there's definitely room for more vocal females in, uh, in this kind of space. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also think to a certain extent, you know, I remember when I first started the listings lab, my first like 50 clients were men. And I remember thinking, am I doing something wrong? Like what, what is, is it my messaging? Like, like I, I actually went in and I started like deep diving through my marketing messaging right from the beginning. Cause I was like, why are they, why are they all men? But I think that what it was is that, you know, and maybe, maybe it's a biological thing. I think men just they jump faster. They're a little bit more as like a, I guess, a stereotype. They're just a little bit more risk. Well, it is. That, taking? In, in but, but all the research I read, mm -hmm. what you've just said is scientifically confirmed. Men that are mm. genetically more inclined as risk takers. Yeah. And, and so, may, I mean, I, that's what I was thinking right off the bat. Cause I, and, and I think too, that um, from a, from a putting yourself out there standpoint, you know, maybe there are, maybe there are fewer women that are, that are wanting to do that, or, you know, maybe not being as aggressive as maybe some of the rest of us. I just want to do, you know, I want to, if it's just the culture of the real estate training yeah. industry, it kind of puts off a lot of females from actually entering the training yeah. because it's so kind of, um, and still is to some extent, so, I'm, trying, I'm struggling for the right words, Jess. Can you help me out? Yeah, definitely. So, so there's definitely there's in the in the mark in the digital marketing space in general. There's this term that we hear a lot that, that's bro marketing, right? And oh, it's yeah. just basically this like this kind of like very masculine. Um, you know, here I am in a suit, looking fly, standing in front of my Lamborghini. You know, it's 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 that kind of marketing message, that kind of Ty Lopez type type marketing message that I think resonates with, it does tend to resonate with a certain type of person. Very rarely are those people going to be female. Um, and, and I think that a lot of the time, a lot of, a lot of the women that come into our programs are looking for a different way. They're like, I don't want to be that agent. I don't want to be the agent on the billboard with I'm number one, look at me, these are my awards. You know, they, they, want, a, they want a more relationship driven approach to marketing. And I think that that's one of the, I think, you know, the fact that I am female also helps with that because the message, it doesn't matter, you know, what the message is, it's still going to come across as a little bit softer because it's coming out of a female hmm you know, head, right? <laughs> and I think well, no, not always, because um no. and I, I'm not trying to be offensive here. There is a certain type of woman to get success, they become kind of um kind of stereotype males in some mm. of their, you know, they actually adopt some of the worst elements of the male psyche, don't they, to obtain that. Um, so they could become, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling again. Yeah, no, no, I got, I got it. I, I, and, and I think to a certain extent, a lot of this just comes down to, do I have to be them in order to be successful? Um, as opposed to, can I just be me? And, and I think that a lot of what I've been able to do is give people permission. And I think a lot of that just comes down to giving themselves permission to be themselves, create those relationships, be authentic, be really straightforward and real about the kind of person that they are. And, you know, I'm actually, it's taken me years to get to this point because I am naturally very introverted. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I really don't love being out. Like I'm, I'm the person who like at the party is next to the cheese and I'm waving at my husband mm -hmm. wanting to go. I and guess. bye. Right. And so, so to a certain extent that way, you know, I think there's this, this mentality that you don't get to be feminine or introverted or any of those things and be able to compete on the same level as, you know, the, the men who, who, who really don't mind screaming it from the rooftops and 
banging their chests a little bit when it comes yeah, to Yeah, because um, I, I think this matters. I'm just going to put this to you, and it may be a couple more questions. And we, yeah, and we'll go for it. Day. Um, is that um, it's, it's linked to, because a, a lot of the clientele are going to be female if you're a male agent or a female age, or, you know, if you're a male agent, a lot of your client, the person that's going to decide to hire you is probably going to be the female. Yep. Right. A lot of the time, yeah, a lot of the time, isn't it? I think, um, and a lot of a lot of people culturally, they they, um, and I kind of put this in dating terms. There's a lot of things that our oh, women are only interested in money. Mm. Well, well, what I think they're really interested in is competence and confidence. Agreed. And those two things are very sexy and very engaging for a woman Mm -hmm. competency and I think just from from a from a human standpoint too that you know I I read a meme the other day and I uh, that that really spoke to me and it made me laugh actually quite a lot because I've experienced this so often um let me see if I can find it it's right here it said you know let me interrupt you let me let me interrupt your expertise with my confidence Right. <laughs> and I think that I think that happens so often where. So in your service, do you when you get a, a male that's very, you know, very got a kind of very old tradition that's been got some, you know, wants to put their success on to the next level, as we discussed in the yeah. podcast. And it's a very old school, very aggressive, you know, I, I can sell you a house. I, yeah. I'm the killer of the local market. I can kill that wildebeest <laughs> the quickest. Yeah. Get, you know, it's really, you know, you, I think you understand where I'm going. Yeah, totally. Um, it, it'll get them so fair, but do you have to kind of coach them a lot that a lot of your clientele is going to be female and they're not quite so as you think, about you killing the wildebeest kind of bit, you know? Yeah, I, th- I think that there's a, there's a little bit of like, you know, am I going to change who that person is over time, maybe in terms of like their approach? But, you know, we had a guy in our program, it, it took him a little bit of time. His name was Jim. He was very traditional. He just, you know, um, and when, once he actually started really understanding the, the psychology of why people move and the pain points and, you know, what this person needs from, from an emotional standpoint in order to feel safe and comfortable and, and all of these things in order for them to choose him as their agent, you know, his, his approach really changed. And he used to joke around with me all the time. He'd be like, you know, you can teach you, you're, you're showing me here that you can teach an old dog, some new tricks. You know, that he's, he's like, I've been the same way for so long. He'd been in the business for like 30 years, but his business and, and his approach to the way he was going about things really shifted through working together. And a lot of it came down to what if we took the focus off of you and it wasn't about you? Yeah, just to butt in a little bit, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also linked to what you said. You get a lot of agents that want to move forward. By moving forward, they've got to apply digital sales techniques where they've got their initial success from more traditional, um, where they kill the wildebeest, probably to some extent might still be effective. But if they try to apply that to a more digital message, it doesn't really work. That it doesn't, well. it doesn't be, translate. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. And I think that digital marketing requires a lot more nuance than that. All right. I think we've taken you enough time. I think we've covered some interesting territory. Hopefully you agree to come I back. I agree. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And you agree to come back on the show in Anytime. Like six, seven months and we have another chat. It's been a pleasure. We'll see you next week where you, me and Robert will have another great guest. Or if not, we'll have a, a discussion between ourselves about digital marketing and the real estate industry. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye.